Hello everyone. Today is October 2nd, Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. And to celebrate his birthday, we are putting up a very special program about a very special community. One of Mahatma Gandhi's ideas was that of Swaraj, that is autonomy. And today we are fighting for autonomy everywhere in India, in communities, for water, sanitation and access to healthcare, education, etc. Now, in urban areas, in urban zones, in many of the Indian states, water and sanitation are a major problem, especially drinking water. Now, the government is not able to satisfy the criteria, though our Jal Shakti and Jal mission, that is a water mission, is to ensure access to running water within every room. So in the meantime, some communities have taken action into their own hands. They have come together, they have formed groups, they have looked into technology designs, they have looked into the corresponding support systems needed and the behavioral change needed to ensure access to water and sanitation. Today, we are in a very special community called Ashiana in the heart of the city of Chennai in India. And we are now going to hear its co-members explain how they brought about a circular economy within this community. Lastly, but not least, this community is extremely renowned and it has won a number of awards. Then the question for the audience is, why isn't this being replicated all over the world? What is it that Ashiana has? Is it the leadership? Is it equipment? Well, that's for you to think about and come to your own conclusion. So the garden that you see, uh, we have a large garden. We have 175 apartments and we have a large garden also, a lot of open space. And so this garden is entirely maintained by the waste that is composted, waste water which is treated. So uh, we have good greenery, but it all comes from uh, what is composted and what is recycled in terms of water. So since we are a large community in the heart of the city, we are large consumers of resources, uh, water being a big part. And we are also large waste generators, Yes, different types of waste. Yes. Uh, it can be kitchen waste, recycle waste, water waste, you know, toilet, everything, bathroom. So we said we should try doing something. And along the way, if the governments, you know, things get, uh, you know, we have clarity in policy, clarity in whatever purpose, uh, we can align ourselves. But we should get started. It helped that a few of us were like-minded and we could start thinking about it. And uh, we just took the initiative and said, let's do it. Because until, until then... It was, we were celebrating, you know, festivals together. We were doing things together, having a nice time. You know, all that was fine. But then beyond that, we need to, to move on. So we said, let's work on some of these things where there is going to be a lot of pressure. So and we did not wait for the government. That's how we got started. That's great. How many people are in this complex? Finally, I mean, kids, uh, old people, everybody included. Yeah, at any point of time, because there are 175 apartments, there are people, you know, who are leaving, there are people who are coming or whatever. At any point of time, we are a minimum of 500 and goes up to 800 people okay. in this community. And how many were you who decided to sort of change things? Uh, we were four of us. Okay. The so. four of us who got started and it helped that uh, they were aware, they were uh, reading, they were looking at things that are happening. And I think that's when the even conversations and things were starting even different even amongst the governments amongst around the world on climate change on waste disposal on various things there was a lot of conversation and we said let's try doing something so in 2007 we started with the uh, you know uh, source segregation we started with the gray water recycling so the water which comes out of our bathrooms uh, we decided we'll filter it we'll do a small it's not very uh, you know technology intensive just a simple filtration process and we used it for our garden because 
Uh, Chennai was at a point where there was acute water shortage and almost every apartment complex house was buying water from outside. Tanker trucks were being used to transport water for households. And so we said, you know, it, so it looked criminal to be using water for the garden. And a lot of people were, you know, including the corporation were telling us not to use water for the garden. There were advertisements, notices and all. So we decided let's do something to reduce our water usage. And so we started using the gray water, that is water from the bathroom. From there, you can go to the next slide. So even to use this gray water, the water for the plants, we decided to use a drip irrigation system. It helped that I'm a farmer. And uh, as you know, farmers have to be innovative. You have to make do with minimum resources. Uh, you have to be everything on a farm. So we implemented this uh, drip irrigation system to deliver the recycled water for our gardens. From there, see, initially it was uh, it was hard. I'm, you know, to get people involved and all. But as we started seeing some success, see, once we started using uh, recycling this water in the garden, and also our composting initiatives and all that, we started seeing some success. So from having a little resistance from different people in our own community, people started, uh, you know, there was a buy-in. People started liking the idea that we were doing this. And there were also economic benefits to this. It was not just a feel-good thing. So while initially it was feel-good, then people started seeing, because our maintenance bills were slowly coming down, little by little. So we went into this RO water. We have a reverse osmosis for drinking water. So because our water is hard, and uh, sometimes of the impurities. So we have this reverse osmosis. The discharge from this was pumped into the sewage. And we realized that we were putting a lot of pressure on the sewage system in our municipality because we as a large apartment complex were uh, the single biggest generators of different types of waste. And the municipality and its old system was not geared to handle this from a single source. So we said, let's try doing something, reduce the pressure on them. The discharge from the RO water was recycled, filtered, and we used it in the flushing tanks, the toilets. And, and then so slowly the success built on. And then over a period, then we decided that when there was an acute water shortage, and uh, we also envisaged that there will come a point where, you know, water itself could be you know, hard to get. They may come a time. And COVID told us that food was a problem at some point. And so there was a lot of resistance to the sewage treatment plant project that we put up in 2018. What, and, why was there resistance, Hari? Uh, for us as a community, it was uh, expensive. People felt like exactly you asked, why should we do it? It's the government's job. Let them do it. And uh, do we need to spend so much money? What is the use of this? It's just a few people feeling good about it. They want to do it just to show that they are, you know, achieving something. So we had to convince them that it is not just a feel good thing. Uh, there could come a time that getting water itself in your apartment complex could be difficult. So at that point of time, when you don't have water in your flush tanks, you are not going to look at the cost of water. You'll just need water at any cost. And that is what we're getting ready for. We don't yes. know when that will happen. It can happen yes. after 10 years. It can happen after 15 years. So, and thing is, the good thing is we got started early because it took us three years to stabilize this project because we found that while there were people on paper uh, doing this for residential apartments, for commercial establishment, we found there was no one who had done it in our city uh, for a residential apartment. So there were a lot of challenges, including how the pipelines were laid out, what kind of uh, waste was, you know, uh, treated, uh, pressure, uh, you know, input, output, a lot of, it took a lot of time and COVID didn't help, of course. Uh, <laughs> we have stabilized this now. It is working well. Uh, we use, we reuse about 15,000 liters of treated water every day. I think uh, this this is goes into the, again, uh, uh, cistern tanks and uh, so through all these initiatives uh, we are able to save or reuse somewhere between 650 to 700 thousand liters of water in a month in our apartment complex 
and what we are working on now is see this was not a is just a group of individuals who wanted to do something and so it is not very well thought out and we didn't have a grand plan so what we are doing now because each of these was a small small project so when we started the grey water cycling we never even thought of the sewage treatment plant none of us had any idea about it so but as the momentum built up in the built up in the community we were able to get buy ins we were able to get more people to participate and people started seeing the results so today what we are doing is we are integrating all the shamat's uh, updates and from the last time we spoke now because each each of these is an individual grey water recycling the ro water discharge being treated and the sewage treatment so now we are integrating this and making it one treated water uh, you know in terms of the pipelines and things like that so that they are not individual projects so that's where we are that's what we have done and how these problems could affect future generations if they went unsolved we also got the uh, waves the house waves uh, together and got this with the part of it uh, and set the context to me so that they knew what they were going to do and why they were going to do that so there was a lot of uh, what and why around the space management uh, uh, right and that was very important in terms of setting the context I just want to make a few comments. Okay, first is one of the uh, one of our concepts that we are trying to promote. It's a, it's a twist on words for any societal problem. We call it the spike solution. The spike it is science, policy, innovation, technology, and engagement. If you just have the others, but without engagement, it doesn't work. Now, Exmoda is a very interesting example of all the international agencies. USAID seems to have done the best in making changes, transformative changes on the ground. Exmoda, I think, is the outcome of a USAID project, and the objective of World Bank, USAID, and all this is finally to leave some capabilities on the ground. Now, Exmoda is one of the few examples which is still active. It's it's receded from the smaller towns, but it's still it is giving knowledge, inspiration, and all that. So that's the policy. What is very interesting to me is that you never mentioned anything about the government. He mentioned getting recognition from the government, but I don't see any direct policy in impacting you. And another interesting thing that I know is that the technology you use initially was light. to put the spark is uh, is really basements and you know engineering because it's a great idea to come with candle lights and uh, do all this so i see the engagement being the biggest progress okay so uh, this is very interesting so the triggering problem i still want to ask you wrong you know it's your inspiration but i didn't see any problem it was your vision is it right that's what i want to ask and i want to ask anybody who wants to add we pass the computer okay let me just say that everybody saw the problem which you know we couldn't probably articulate but we knew that there was a problem in the making and the problem already possibly existed in a very uh, uh, big manner uh, but you know we could see a problem that in some ways was invisible right because there was no problem statement before us there was no so i just want to ask the ladies if they want Add anything? Was there any complaints? Did you feel anything? Was what was bothering you? It wasn't. Uh, I mean, there wasn't any problem at that time. But as Ram said, as a community, we were. You know, we were. Uh, we had people who we were. You know, thinking ahead of time. We were. You know, we were thinking ahead of time. And um, uh, Ashkana does have a community of people with you know similar bent of mind. so we were able to convince people for the need to change as far as the government was concerned there was no stricture or policy in place at that time that came on much later you see he has given us some i want you to elaborate now he said he he went abroad he had all these interesting experiences so he went to exnora which we call in academics the knowledge holder which was able to tell you what to do were there any other persons that you contacted i mean what was the thought process did you think that ram had an interesting idea why did you think it was interesting 
one was we were thinking way ahead and we would see every other day that the chennai corporation was struggling civil corporation was struggling with the waste and how much uh, there was pollution waste was being burnt you know it was all uh, consolidated there was no segregation and uh, pollution disease you know all that was bothering us uh for me personally uh, the way i saw it at that time this like the community started thinking about it uh we were we also had a large garden now we still have a very good garden so immediately it connected with me that you know we can use the compost what we have made in our own garden and uh, so it looked like a very very logical rather than dumping it in the waste and then going and buying you know manure so there was in some ways one part of me also had an agenda that convert this to compost and use it in our garden and stop buying the compost so that also uh, worked but in terms of a policy i think only in 2016 was it uh, you know was it a policy and you know the government started implementing it until then it was just our vision our interest and what we wanted to do so i i'm still wanting to go through the thought process so he he did you chat ram with hari about your vision we all did we all did so buana you know who's Bu- buana yeah, so yeah that's it so how did the thought process reach you i want to know how this what else as you know what um Uh, i would say that you know ashyana had the community uh, with uh, uh, people with strong values of you know hard working you know ready to change not taking shortcuts and when uh, the small group of people got together there was hari there was ram there was kailash and chandru there were lots of other people and anita and the others when we got together and um, what happened was we were very easily able to make the change in people right because we were all of a similar kind of bent of mind so that was the in my view the the turning point which happened because people were ready to change uh then i'm i'm come back to you think, yes please please go ahead so you know one very interesting thing is we used children we use the kids in ashana as agents of change right what was reason we did that is because they don't really question they have a tremendous bias to action they convinced about something they jump into action so we use them as agents of change so you know we actually use them to go stick posters in every apartment uh, you know about conserving energy conserving water and so segregation of waste so that's one of the things that we did you know very very deliberately used to you know the kids of ashan as agents of change so which how old were these kids they were uh, various shapes and sizes <laughs> from the age of 5 to maybe 5 to uh, uh, 14 15 instantly one of those kids is now joined london school of economics to pursue environmental sciences that's very cute. she was a very active member of the ashan agri club uh, hari was there anybody outside the community who influenced the thought process besides exnora that is exnora they are the experts anybody else uh, i think mr indra kumar and exnora uh, guided us yes so because the challenge was uh, while i was doing it in a large scale in my farm to do it in a community uh, because we did have challenges in terms of will it stink will there be foul smell will the ground water be Uh, you know will it seep and will it affect the ground water the garbage go so we had these challenges so uh, i think uh, fr- i personally spoke to many people to understand how we can contain it because at every stage we would uh, you know people had these concerns will our water table get affected uh, you know will it uh, our compost bit so we actually changed our compost bit a little bit so we had a, a concrete surface at the bottom whereas i would never do that in my farm so but here to make sure people are not anxious and so we had that so the uh, things like this came up and then i would speak to various people uh, to understand if this will work and i think 2006 and early 2007 was the goof time where we experimented 
In fact, Thomas put in our personal money. We, uh, we redid the whole thing. And, you know, because things were not working. Before we got the general body approval and people uh, actually buying into this. So, uh, yes, in terms of a name, if you want to say it's Indra Kumar and Exmora, but I think in terms of implementation challenges, uh, we spoke to many people. Many people. Many people to understand how to do this. Will this work? Okay. Um, uh, this is very interesting. I think Maria is going to be nodding a lot because... Uh, uh, can you hear me, Maria? Because yes, I can hear you. That she says is to build a knowledge base. Because when there is a societal problem, and so this knowledge base is not, you know, it's not what's in the science books. It's it's really doing things like what you said. So did I? My what I want to do uh, us now is. This knowledge base, did it come only from the members? Did your friends help you? Did the people here help you learn? How did you learn about uh, anything about these kind? Of, or do you have a prior knowledge? Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sorry. I am Vidya Balakrishnan. Uh, I am into basically some social causes. But togetherness in Ashiana to do whatever we need to do together. So... Okay, uh, how did I get to know? Was I interested? We are a, when we started in 2006, we were not a very huge community. So each and every one of us were very interested in any innovations. And so we were, jumped into it with a lot of vigor and empty. So, the, and not only we, it was mainly that the next generation should sustain our projects in Ashiana. So, we had to also educate our children. So the best thing was we get to know everything first and then teach it to the children so that they continue with it. And that is the success here that I think there are at least four sets of children who have come in. And till today, the mothers and anyone who comes into Ashiana, uh, we are very lucky and fortunate that they want to learn. They come together. We have our own small parties and meetings where we, as, he, as Ari said, see how, to, how it is done because it is taught in a very playful manner. So that, that is how is, we learn. That is very interesting. Did you, in please introduce yourself, did you have to learn something special to join the gang? Uh, I'm Anita Igde. Hi. Uh, I didn't have to, I just joined them. I was too willing to do uh, to make uh, Ashiana greener. So whenever I got the opportunity, whether it was water conservation or um, you know so segregation, I was there. I was only too willing to go around speaking to people, uh, spreading awareness along with the other volunteers, and uh, um, and we did some major uh, overalling or enhancement of rainwater uh, harvesting structures here in Ashiana. So, uh, with the help of an expert, of course, and uh, uh, so I, I've been there. That's it. So, if you ask me to do something which will help our community, I'm there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can I, yeah, please, please. Yeah. please. Uh, I remember when Ram actually came around, Ram and my brother in law Kailash came around saying, please don't use bin liners for your uh, kitchen waste. I rebelled. I said, I don't want to do that. And, but of course, with a lot of uh, cajoling, I did uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, agree. And But initially, I didn't want to do that. So, thanks, Ram, for <laughs> I want to help. To that. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, I remember when the we suggested bin liners, plastic bin liners not be used. And we had a meeting and uh, we were trying to explain. We were at pains to explain and uh, uh, I was just grilled. And I remember this uh, senior <laughs> citizen, and uh, he was livid. <laughs> and I was at pains to explain to him, and uh, he would not, he was not convinced. He was, he put my hand in the bin. Uh, I was trying to tell him in a nice way, yes, but uh, <laughs> I know, finally he let me go. I think probably he decided he'll be fine that day. But uh, it was tough. So it was tough. While you know, knowledge is the thing. You know, I always say that earthworms, the composting that happens, that's the ear part. Because 
they do what they are expected to do they listen to you people uh, in getting them to do follow discipline that's very hard so those were challenges so you know just as an uh, you know up to us we had this good cop bad cop kind of behavior but how do you like to say uh, much to my delight we see him do what i would all have to do so but the part see just to answer shama's question we got connected to uh, we did a couple of things we uh, we got people to change from the filament bulb to cfl lamps like that time cfl was big we're talking of the mid mid early uh, 2000s right and uh, thereafter we actually adopted led and just remember led is now all over but at that point of time led was emerging technology so we we actually got uh, we changed the common lighting to led and you know with with very suboptimal kind of uh, consequences because the lights were not particularly great at that point of time but to answer your question yeah we did draw on the knowledge of a few others out of this ecosystem uh, so what i just see is and i think raja will also be interested in this uh, mm-hmm. it's very important to have community leaders community champions i would say and uh, what is interesting is that to be able to champion these things you don't need to have a phd in uh, vermicompost yeah. you, you know you can just understand how some yes, it's difficult to <laughs> so but it is it is for accessible knowledge you didn't have to have a nobel prize winner come here and explain things to you you were able to acquire the knowledge yourself that is very important so now that knowledge thing is done let's you been mentioning various achievements let's go one by one what was the first achievement that it was the composting or the water which one was first composting. then then i am asking the compost man to explain what exactly it is and okay. what was done right so i think the headline project uh, while today if you walk into ashiana there are many big projects and very impressive and all but what really got us together in those initial days was the source segregation and composting so as i was saying 175 apartments and uh, we assumed there would be a lot of kitchen waste we would be collecting every day and uh, we were wrong there and uh, so what we realized was unless there's a lot of food waste you know you throw away food the peels and you know all those actually don't amount to so much so it doesn't amount to 100 100 more than 100 150 grams a day per household some in some households where there's just one or two people it could even be as less as 50 grams so over a period of, we found that per day the collection of the kitchen waste was not that big an amount it was not huge yeah and so we typically had four pits we had four pits and we would rotate amongst these so all the collection would happen in one pit and the biggest thing was before the decomposition it was the dehydration that took over you know so if you go linear if you're collecting x amount of uh, waste per day into so many days you would expect this is the volume right mathematically but then by the time you finish 10 days that volume has gone down by dehydration so we realized there was dehydration and then decomposition so every pit could actually collect up to 25 days of kitchen waste for the entire apartment complex yeah which the size of the compost pit if you see you it won't look possible but that is what we did and then in 45 days after that we were able to uh, churn out good quality compost so every day we would you know it was like a sandwich so every day we would have the kitchen waste collected from all the blocks yeah every block had a, a, a sweeper or a garbage collector who would collect everything bring it and then once it's done the gardener would you know uh, put a small layer of uh, well composted farmyard manure and it would act as a sandwich it would contain the foul smell uh, it would start the decomposition yes and we would close this uh, pit with a mesh so that you know animals or birds don't make a mess of it and this would go on and once we close the pit in 45 days we had well composted manure which we would use across our garden 
and the biggest thing as i mentioned earlier is we over a period of time we stopped relying on outside material for the garden of our size ashiana is uh, with the buildings and park and all is around 3 acres of land uh, we would have had to spend uh, at least three times the amount we spend now on maintaining the garden yeah so that was the benefit though we didn't think of the economic benefit initially but then that ended up being an ancillary benefit and good quality manure so we have no doubts about the quality of manure and how we do it so this was a thing so we don't there were suggestions on we should sell the manure and all that no we didn't get into all that so i think there is sufficient manure for our garden for the flowering plants all the greenery in ashiana and we maintain a very good greenery we have over uh, you know 60 trees we have lots of flowering plants and so uh, it's it's a good one. so the next probably you want to no this 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 idea of reusing for the own thing is very interesting abhishek patak our junior manager was complaining when he came here you know he said about how things were so much better but he said in jharkhand where he comes from he says they have the uh, ores of coal they have all the coal fields in their state but yet they are suffering from power cuts he <laughs> said in chennai he hasn't suffered so much in his time here from power cuts so he said many times what happens is when you have something you get into so much this this need to have a business model to to make something out of it you forget it's actually much easier if you serve local needs now i know that the another very big achievement and that's that's what some people are waiting for is also the grey water recycling and the drip irrigation and all that so i'm going to give it to bona then i'll vidya, vidya sorry vidya and then we will uh, excuse me you know i must go and let's we will take rounds with everyone yes please thank you thank you i mean okay um, we'll talk about the liquid waste management so we'll start with the grey water recycling why did we go into it okay like he said around 2006 2005 just one clarification yes. please explain what grey water is is it only from the kitchen or kitchen yeah, and down to that yeah okay. chennai yes so there was huge scarcity of water in chennai and everywhere we were buying tankers so we were only thinking like we are a, i mean an association we have lack of scarcity of funds also so we're thinking how are we going to manage why not use our own waste water reuse it so that you know that much amount of water can be uh, used and you know we need to buy that many tankers of water so what is it we did we first selected three or four blocks and we fixed filters of charcoal sand and pebbles or coal the bath water from these houses you know there are 16 houses so one side 1632 for all these were connected and they came through a pipeline the grey water what we call as the grey water the bath water comes out as waste which goes through the drains outside instead of taking it outside we took it through the drain to the garden where there was a tank and the water was filtered through this and taken to another tank from where we water a simple very uh, 1.5 hp water and to this we connected the drip irrigation tubes which we'll get into later so that we could completely use that water for watering all our plants just like how hari said by this time we were very enthusiastic and all our entire uh, you know the entire area was covered on all sides by so many plants trees etc and and prashant was telling us that we need to use lesser water for watering plants because we need it for people rather than for plants so that is when we thought we cannot avoid, avoid i mean we cannot allow the plants to be so we thought we will use this filtered water and it was sufficient to uh, cater to at least half of the plants so then we thought okay since this is working properly we will add on four more blocks 
So those were again added. The water from those were taken to another side of a garden. We made a similar grey water cycling plant there. The water was filtered, the motor was fixed, and this again the grey water, which was I mean it's not portable, but definitely it was useful for the plants. And now we had come to a position where this grey water was sufficient to water all the plants in the garden. So that that really helped us to reduce the number of water tankers which we bought, and we have our own uh, personnel who will you know clean the uh, jelly and the pebbles every every fifteen days, and then dry it and then put it in again. So it was going on as a very uh, successful project. So this is about grey water cycling. If you have any questions. Huh? Yes, as I said, uh, the water from the grey water when we put in the motor, it went to the small pipes through which we did a drip irrigation, which again, instead of using the hope, hose pipes for the watering, it was just dripping on the, uh, you know, the oil plants and that was much more sufficient. So about this, I think Hari will be a better person to talk. Yeah. So we use the drip irrigation system since, uh, like Vidya said, we were facing an acute water shortage at that time. So we needed to see how how to save this water, whatever water we had recycled or filtered. And so uh, drip irrigation was that was something I had done in my farm, and it was working very efficiently. So uh, you know, I spoke to a few people and to see how we can do it uh, in house in a domestic scenario, and uh, so. We devised the system for effective delivery because there had to be enough pressure from these tanks to go across uh, Chiana. So some of it was gravity and some of it we had to uh, pump. So depending on the location, the farthest location had to be pumped and then the nearer ones uh, in our park and all it was more of gravity. And uh, so the drip irrigation was effective delivery. So we used lesser water and just enough water. So that way we could say where we wanted water at which point and uh, so it was it was great that way so that way all our plants got wherever we needed the water uh, you know as vidya and uh, hari talk i just realized that by that time I, this was not very late it was in 2006 or so yeah. you know our six seven uh, you know what it started as uh, you know some kind of sporadic set of ideas and concept had become institutionalized so uh, I think there was a management committee uh, uh, in 2007 where Vidya, Hari and I were part of that. Um, so Hari came up with the idea of uh, drip irrigation. Someone else said grey water recycling and it was immediately accepted. We had to call an extraordinary general meeting to uh, you know, spend the money. But we got it done. But, uh, but, the, but the point really is that you know, very quickly this, this whole concept had become institutionalized. And it was part of the thinking of the management committee. This is, uh, I just want to mention that the drip irrigation is a great idea. And this, there is extreme resistance to this idea all over the world. And this has to become a way of life because we have to save water. I must say in my own NGO, you see, I've been telling the ladies, you know, they spend hours watering plants. I said, we can put a simple water and put a drip irrigation. And then what is this nonsense? It's coming out of a hole. What is this? Madam, please, you know economics, but you don't know these things. You let us. So I think I must take you to the village to explain. So now I'm coming. So I want to say that this is very interesting that you got people to agree because this is a main problem, major problem everywhere. Now, uh, we are living in a world where social identity is very important for everything, you know, the, for policy, for social aid. And in the UN, uh, we are in the UN University, uh, we are always told about genderization. We have to genderize everything. We have to make sure. I even told some of the Finn posters. I asked, where are the women? In your poster, we made sure, you know, you okay. were one man. And so I, I, I know that the initiative was started by men, but I, 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 I got a very interesting comment from uh, Hari while I was uh, uh, formulating this question. 
he said, it doesn't make sense, this question. We, we were all just humans. So I want to ask the ladies and I want to ask so you people. I to... So I think you, I mean, we'll, give them, we'll go like this first and you can all answer. I want to know about the genderization of the initiative. Hi. It wasn't by design. It just happened. I think in the initial years, there were more men in the committee. So they were meeting more often, meeting one another, and they just came up with certain ideas. Subsequent uh, projects and implementation and, uh, uh, you know, taking care of the many, many women were involved. So this wasn't by design at all in Ashiana. Maybe the women at that time were, you know, busy raising children and, you know, involved in other activities. And by 2016, I think we took a greater role because our children had grown up and, uh, you know, we had more time on our hands. That's my view. So, uh, Sham, all your respects to you, the question that you brought up. You know, it's fairly irrelevant in Ashana because it's all about women power. You know, Ashana is actually effectively run by very competent and dynamic women. I think Hari and I are part of this quota where one or two, <laughs> one or two men actually managed to sneak in. And I'm, not, I'm only half joking, right? Because the extremely dynamic women and I don't know, you know, how this whole uh, change happened. I think there were a few men involved, but, but over the last several years, this whole movement has gathered steam and it's got entrenched because we have a whole, we have a very big team which consists of women, Hari. Ramesh and I are probably the three men, three and Bharat, maybe four exceptions, uh, you know, and, and the women are really, you know, very dedicated. They're very strident. They're very passionate about what they do. So in some ways, this is something that we take for granted in Ashana that, you know, this, this whole community and uh, our initiatives are now run by women. I actually find this question condescending. So I, you know, we never thought of it. So for instance, uh, if you ask me my personal agenda, why did I get involved? It is because my family benefits, my community benefits. And not, never for once is it because I'm a man or whatever it is. So uh, so I expect all the others also, all the ladies, uh, they had similar thoughts, not about being a man. So it is just they were able to contribute. And if you see the women in Ashana are very accomplished. So, you know, all the people we have, we've had every year we have a president or a secretary who's a woman. And consecutively, and uh, they are professionally qualified. They are very talented. Generalization of work that is division of labor. No, ne never was. Yes. Uh, then, uh, like I said, it was just what people could do, what they were willing to do, and uh, it was nothing about uh, being a man or a woman. I'll give it to Vidya now. Maybe she can share what she. No, this is uh, only on a very lighter vein, as uh, Ram was telling. Every time money was involved in any project, it was the, you know, the EGM or the AGM. So we were the Shaktis, you know, who could really bring it up and take the concern from the, uh, you know, the residents more than the men could. And I have the permission of the men to say. So there was absolutely no gender differentiation in Asia and especially we, the women, were encouraged by the men to take up post and to get the approval for all these projects. So specifically, men did not really join some of the activities in which the ladies were involved. This year, I must say, when we called, uh, you know, people forward to make paper bags for Navratri, a lot of men turned up. Yes, so Ram, <laughs> take a bow. He did. He also joined. So what the academic literature says is this is kind of a, this kind of societal problems. You need to build a shared vision first. And they said, women usually talk to each other and talk to people more than men. So they always said that you need women to be the sustainability champions. That is the, so, the, it, it, but it is still interesting that though she, Vidya, mentioned that communication was very important and that kind of communication was really done by women because they will talk more about these things. So it's uh, other than that, it is amazing that uh, we are having this kind of non-gendered uh, work. So while these people are taking a break, uh, just to drink water or whatever, can you please introduce yourself and tell us why your interest, why you are here? And maybe also ask any questions you might want before we go on. Would you like that? So I'm going to start.
Maria, would you like to introduce yourself? Then I'm going one by one. Okay, thank you. Maybe I can start. So my name is Maria Tomai. I, I'm a PhD fellow at the United Nations University in the Netherlands. And I'm studying uh, how communities and cities, um, mostly in developing countries, can transform into more circular and sustainable. <laughs> so, so I'm focusing... Back. Yes. And now, Mr. Uh, the, the first one whom I'd ask to unmute, Sir Malavika Ganapati iPad. Oh, my name is Ganapati. I must mention that I am an outsider so far as ASEAN is concerned. But my connections have been through Kailasnath, uh, Govna and Panchanadu and Malni. I belong to their family and I've seen the work done right from the time they came into as uh, uh, st staying in Ashiana. And the latter part of it is what work has been done by the uh, excellent teamwork. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, hello. Yeah, actually, uh, I got uh, this. Uh, it was a forward for me from some other groups, actually. But we are working in Mumbai on similar lines. We are working with some of the societies, housing societies, where the waste is getting uh, converted into compost and other methods. We are uh, actually, I'm a researcher, but we have developed some of the technologies, actually. Uh, for that are useful for the societies actually. So we have biogas plant technologies there, composting technologies are there. So that's why I was curious to know. That's why I joined. And it, okay. I find that it is but very good. Huh? It is very good. Huh? Maybe what you can do is maybe we at Finn will be happy to post your technologies on the website. So yes, yes, yes. if they are open to the public and to be implemented by yeah, society, yeah. we are happy to help in the yes, process. Yes. Yeah, I will share with you. I will share Thank with you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Does anybody else want to introduce themselves? One last person. Hi. Yes. I am Ashraf Sajiv. I I saw. Sorry that I was a little late to join. By the way, so that I I missed some of those portions. But uh, I was very passionate in waste management, and I interned with Finn. That was my first start. Thank you. Yes. 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 So uh, that was how I started my base management. Uh, then, uh, re and recently I got an opportunity to work as a project manager at Sahasuru Waste, where I was deputed to build the Industries Association. So we were mostly into municipal solid wet as well as dry waste of those whole industrial area. And at the same time, if it is uh, so wet, wet waste, we convert into organic manner. And dry waste, we send it for recycling. We divide it into, segregate it into 20 different verticals. So okay. one of my interests, which I have to tell is here, as a part of women empowerment, how women can actually work in those fields so, okay. so that they become financially independent. As well. You've all said again and again that you, it seems to be too easy to do things in Russia now. And so, first I want to know, did you have anybody who was griping besides the old gentleman uh, whom you managed to convince, I guess? What were, the challenges, what were the challenges that you faced in getting community to engage? So, everybody will go around like this. Everybody can say this is the question. Um. So now to engage the entire community and move towards making Ashiana greener, some of us came together, we invited volunteers from each residential block to form a group. We named it Ashiana Green Club. This was 2016. Earlier, it was the Environment Club with limited number of uh, like-minded members. And in 2016, it took a new avatar. Green Club focuses on small steps in making the community green by involving everyone in the community, uh, residents and staff. Covers every area, be it water, solid waste, a green cover and more. The MC was working on bigger projects like energy saving, recycling water and more. Uh, now the volunteers, we volunteers were 
only too willing to visit each and every apartment in their respective blocks to spread awareness, to conserve water, uh, and explain why uh, there was need to do so, and to explain and answer questions on source segregation of solid waste. We um, requested residents to buy two bins each, green for the wet waste and red for the landfill. We offered and actually bought uh, them for some residents who were not ready to uh, uh, take us seriously or, or any new changes, you know. And we placed a fairly big bin in front of every block because people uh, for the recyclables, because people were hesitant to keep too many bins in there apartments. We labeled the blue bin uh, as uh, uh, recyclables and not waste because, um, you know, we didn't want residents to be hesitant in handling it. Uh, we succeeded in engaging a scrap dealer who was willing to collect the recyclables uh, at least twice a week. He himself is committed. He turned out to be a boon to us. He's knowledgeable and is committed. I remember calling him several times uh, and asking, you know, in the earlier days, what goes where, whether it's recyclable or not, uh, whether thermocol is recyclable, whether toothpaste tubes are. So he was helping us and we were making our own list. So the next step was to make posters and uh, uh, to get, uh, we got colorful posters on what goes where printed and distributed to each and every apartment. So it became easier for us later when WhatsApp group was formed. And uh, um, the, so, uh, I mean, it became easier when each block formed their own uh, WhatsApp uh, group and every block had its own uh, re volunteer, representative, AGC representative. So, um, and uh, I'll just uh, give the, this to Bhuvana. So she will uh, explain how more difficulties we had and how we engage more and more people, like children, and to make, uh, uh, you know, posters on several themes, uh, like water saving, etc. And we were becoming greener and greener. Agency. Now, this was a great account. This was great account. I think it is a fun. I'm going to put a challenge question. I'm starting with you, Anita. Suppose I'm, I'm a neighbor. I don't want to do any extra work. What are these people? These ladies, okay, they are all very interesting. They are all doing things. I'm not interested. You come to the house. I said, Madam, my TV program is going to start in five minutes. Can you please come next Saturday? If I tell like that, what would you say? We'll say, sure, we will come next Saturday. But it's important that we meet. And uh, that's it. We did not give up. We, it's an ongoing process. And it's just going. And there are a lot of new people coming into uh, our community, you know, and uh, uh, new residents. So this is an ongoing process. So we, we don't give up. We volunteers are not going to give up. Right. That is that is very interesting, and then I'll say that at a community level, the I've got some. I will. I know. I'll talk some more about some of the challenges we face. Now, Anita said that you know we went asking people to buy the two bins. As uh, you know, Ashiana has a hundred and seventy-five uh, apartment. Most uh, hard, you know, kind of move out every year. Right, so we have to keep going and revisiting those houses, new houses, and talking to people. See, that's a continuous process. Now, when we went to some of the apartments, uh, the people, the residents said, "We already have bins. I mean, why should I? In I have an orange bin, so why should I buy a red one?" Right. So, uh, in one of the volunteers, Sudha Bharat, she said, "Let's take an insulation tape, right? A red and a green one." And if it is an orange, just put a red insulation tape and that makes it red. Or if it was, a, you know, a black one, you just put a green bin. So that signifies, you know, that it's a green bin. Right. Now, we were also conscious of not generating more waste. So this was one of the things we did to make sure, you know, that people uh, you know, segregated in different bins. Right. Now, another challenge we faced, we told people that you have to put things absolutely dry in the blue bin, the recyclable waste. Now, we have lots of milk sachets coming out from, you know, each part. Uh, people don't dry them, right? So we said, you, have to, you know, rinse it lightly, dry them, and then put. 
So that meant extra work. And as uh, Shama, you said, you know, a lot of people say hey, we don't really want to do that. But we said it was absolutely imperative that it should be dry, right? So uh, with gentle, you know, persuasion and cajoling, we were able to achieve that. So then I, my challenge question for you is, suppose I'm the same mean old lady and I say, then I'm going to find out and I sneak in some wet milk, wet milk such a, what would you do? How you find out? Yeah. So when the recycler, you know, comes to collect, he, you know, he sometimes points this out to us and he calls the block volunteer. So we go down, we take a picture and, you know, we put that in the WhatsApp group and say, we won't specifically mention names, but say, you know, somebody has, you know, not put something dry in it. So nine times out of 10, people change. So this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is a gentle not uh, nudge. Yeah, this is not. <laughs> so who did you talk to, from? A lot of people, but uh, you know, I still have gleaned from what you know Anita and Bona said. Uh, the challenges are largely related to implementation, not so much about acceptance by the community. We've never had, by and large, we've not had anyone who said, uh, I wouldn't want to do this. There were some very practical problems that would come up saying that you know, people would say, I need to line my bin because I don't want to, you know, clean the bin, which Bona already touched upon earlier. Uh, so all the problems are implementation related. And, uh, you know, it's very important to note that we'll never be 100%. We don't think we'll ever be 100% because this is not mandated by the government. This is not a habit yet. It's not like in the West that, you know, where or certain developed countries where if you don't segregate, your waste does not get taken away, right? So this is a community initiative. I think we will get marks of 7 by 10. 7 out of 10 is what I think. And we will die trying. But but as long as this is not this is not institutionalized at a national level, there's only so much that we can do from an implementation point of view because the various players in this system, right? The players include the residents themselves, you have the, the housemates, or the people who pick up the garbage, the people who deposit the garbage in the post bin or the different bins, uh, you know, respectively. Then there's somebody who comes and takes uh, takes the, you know, the garbage into the corporation. So there's so many players. So I don't think we can ever be 100%, but we'll definitely try. Um, I just want to add a few points about the international scene. Uh, there is no, there's no system that's 100% good. Okay, for example, you see in Maastricht, uh, they... They, they had, you're supposed to separate into many, many varieties. So, and then what the, there's only one main uh, trash. There, there's one third of the community which is changed every time. And they have to be taught. But what people do is they cheat systematically. Because no waste collector can check every day everything. Then I found that the Irish are complaining about other things. They, you have to pay fines if they do spot check. So to prevent pay, facing fine, fine, sorry, prevent paying fines, what it seems some people do is they throw it in a neighbor's bin. Then, yeah, so they do not, they do not get fined and that do not in their street. They say, go Go find a random person two streets down and put it. So one lady was complaining that she got fined majorly by the municipality and it was not her trash. Then another thing they do is go to public parks. They go to forests at night and they just put. And youth is the biggest problem because youth holds all these parties and they just litter. So I just wanted to ask Hari. And you, because both of you, we, which is, first of all, was there any age or, sorry to use the word, gender, which was more challenging? Okay. Age group or gender group, which was more challenging. And uh, then we will do the same for the water. See, like uh, Ram said, there are many players in this, even within the community. So we could hold meetings and then one person from the household would come. 
and he or she would say all the right things you know when i went to germany i saw this and in uh, switzerland they were doing this and this is lovely you know all that would be nice so you would hear all the right things yeah and then when you go to the households it's not happening so what was happening with the spot checks uh, if you remember bovana yes. we found many people and these were people who were championing you know we would not suspect that this is the person who would uh, you know be the uh, not doing it right and we would go with the garbage collectors you know it would be a surprise thing it was unannounced and we would found find that this household is not doing it properly or they just mixed it up and then it was see the first round was educating pleading and you know appealing to them subsequently it was actually shaming so we would catch them red handed not doing it and they would explain that their maid or there was some visitor or there was a maid who didn't do it properly the cook didn't do it whatever but the fact that they started realizing that we would land up i think helped and we would also talk to the garbage uh, collectors the people who collected it and ask them is everything okay and they would be able to tell us is these households are not okay uh, there's a problem with this house because they would notice because uh, people are repeat offenders if they are not okay they are repeat offenders so we would then focus on them so so i could be in a meeting and i could say you know all the nice things that you want to hear but uh, in my house it may not happen so that was the problem and i may not be aware so the problem is to repeatedly go and be there when the garbage is being collected so at the source they're able to identify where the problem and entire household is made aware so it's not that they have decided they're not going to do it it is also it could be that the people in the house are not cooperating someone is not aware yeah so so vidya uh, hari has mentioned about all these spot checks and so forth have you lost any friends due to some spot checks <laughs> yes uh, i think i should mention an incident here that you know you were asking how do you find out we have a very interesting way of finding out who is not segregating let's say i live in the b block and uh, you know you were also mentioning about where these are kept very secretively so in our block we find out that right in the middle of the night when the lights are switched off they come and keep the unsegregated uh, waste right next to the huge blue bin under the staircase and quietly slither away so this went on and we and it was also liquid waste which was you know coffee decoction all spilling everywhere it was a mess and how did we find out we opened the bag we tried to find out the name of the people on the letters <laughs> and we literally found out okay this is be so and so then we went and rang the bell and we i had a very big fight and now for 5 6 years we were not even on talking terms because she felt when we you know we go as a group of 5 6 people when we tell us see we found this letter i don't want to go without proof this was in the bag which was not segregated so you better be careful you know very close i can talk with her so that was where the closeness ended but now we are okay Now, this is this is very un- interesting because there was another initiative like this in Bangalore where the shaming took place with the bhajan group that is the holy song so they would go and sing songs outside the house of you know so that every community would know and that poor lady the head of the bhajan group who was heading this you know she after some she irritated so many people that she had to go more discreet on underground you know she can't have the bhajans in front of the house so that was that was this now I, another thing that is um, the last question before we go to the uh, we go to the audience to ask their questions is that two questions number one which is easier to handle in terms of become behavioral change is it solid waste management or liquid waste management so how would you what would you advise you know if you were the municipality if i am a corporate officer now i have been given the mandate clean chennai by 2020 why i lose my job and start so i have to make 
nightly do i just announce it is clean and show a few places or you know do i attack what do i do do i start with solid or liquid that's first how do i change the behavior where is it more difficult solid base or liquid base this is the advice that the municipality is asking you liquid waste is um uh, more on uh, i think uh, uh, the community level and solid waste is probably more difficult it's like individual homes you know they generate a lot of waste so if we were the, uh, that's a question if we were the corporation and uh, uh, how to yeah so people are not going to toe the line this is what you want to know is it, is it what do you advise me to do do you want me to start with the liquid waste first or do you want me to start with the solid waste first and okay. how do i tell them so maybe you could start with the solid waste because our landfills are expanding and uh, um you know this is what i would uh, uh, yeah i would say yeah, yeah yeah and if people don't tow the line so corporation also has to get bit serious and start penalizing people like not collect their unsegregated garbage and uh, um uh, you know like uh, and maybe uh, uh, you know charge them some fee you know for not doing uh, you know fine for not doing so i uh, i have a slightly different view on this because uh, water as a resource is becoming more and more scarce and as hari constantly tells us that no amount of money is going to help you get water in a few years from now so i think the corporation should focus more on uh, liquid waste yeah the one minute so sure so if you take solid waste i think it's a it's a burning problem really really literally a burning problem because in india we burn waste every 100 kilometers we have these dump yards so which means your uh, your your soil is polluted air is anyway polluted and water is polluted we don't have the luxury of time so bring in punitive measures and tell people that for instance the, the solid waste management rules came in the i think 2002 so it's not for want of rules the question of how long are you going to take to implement some more decades and it'll be too late so i think you just got to bring punitive uh, measures if there are colonies that don't uh, or if there's there are people in colonies who don't adhere to this fortunately the colony has to be punished by the source now i mean the waste not being taken away from that particular colony uh, i think then we should start with the chief minister street right and uh, try to see what happens in his household because that would be a pipe dream but still uh if the choice was we start with liquid or solid then uh, i would say start with liquid uh though solid is like ram said a burning problem it is very important and uh, we don't have much time but in terms of uh, getting started i think liquid is that way easier it's also a direct benefit because in terms of people are going to buy less water they're going to see the benefit immediately and we could probably use that to gather momentum and get people to see the benefits and also move them to solid and the things so in my opinion if you had only could start with only one thing then start with liquid as uh, i agree with hari that uh, liquid waste has to be uh, taken up first by the corporation so there are two things which the corporation will take it as an advantage one is if the liquid waste in every colony is being used for something then they can provide lesser amount of metro water to that colony and not only that they will be this colony which the liquid uses will be pushing out lesser water to in banks so for them draining the water will be much easier if the liquid waste is taken care of so i guess what anita meant is at a household level solid waste has to be done but that is the buy in for that from the people is going to be much more so now what i'm going to ask is everybody to show their faces okay please show your face and if you want to ask a question ask now i'll pass it around okay who wants to go first question please 
Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for this very, very interesting talk. Uh, I really got so many ideas and I was keeping notes while you were talking. So thank you so much. I just have a comment first, and that is that usually, from my experience, when uh, I study about behavioral change and how to make uh, behaviors of citizens change towards more sustainable practices, usually here we overemphasize on providing the right incentives, monetary incentives, right infrastructure, and so on. But what I learned also from today is that really this inspiration that you mentioned in the beginning, like showing and learning from other people who made it um, in different cases, for example, or building on community engagement and building the shared vision, uh, for me, was was very critical for the success of this case. So I really learned a lot on how you, you can really put this as a priority, maybe, uh, first. So I have two short questions. Um, the first is um, when I first, uh, like in the very first presentation of Mr. Harris, uh, with the, uh, you, you presented some pictures while you were explaining the, the mission and the vision of the project. And in some of this, I saw that, for example, when you talked about uh, grey water recycling or some other practices, uh, in the pictures you showed some quite um, uh, heavy infrastructure. You had some installments, you had some pipes, some type of machines and so on that you used. I, I was wondering, uh, how did you finance this? Because um, it, it, it was not very clear to me how you financially sustained these operations. And the second question is, sorry if you covered it and I missed it, about the recyclables. So you had the segregation process to food waste, uh, recyclables like plastic, metals and so on. How did you proceed them afterwards, that, like plastics, metals, glass? Did you just uh, send them to the formal collection system of your city overall? Did you have any special agreement with service providers that you could gain some extra money maybe out of it? Or did you just dispose them in the formal collection uh, systems? Yeah, that's my question. Thanks, Maria. So in terms of the infrastructure, uh, the financing of it, so we had to go to the general body, our community general body for the extra funding. So anything, because we have a budget, we work on a budget and the community approves this budget in the general body. And there is a certain amount of money, the committee, because every year we have an elected committee, elected representatives of this community, committee, uh, community who, are, who form the committee members. And they're allowed to spend up to a certain amount on projects which are beneficial to the community. But beyond a certain amount, it has to get the approval of the community. So, so the general body would approve. For instance, the grey water recycling or the drip irrigation system cost a certain amount of money, which was over and above our uh, budget for that year, which would have normally you know, been okay. So if we had spent a certain smaller amount, it would have, we needn't have gone for approval. So... In this general body, we present the project, we say the benefits, and we get the approval of the community. And that is how we went about it. And uh, in some of these projects... Uh, what is the annual contribution to the community as, uh, let's say, uh, average monthly salary? The annual contribution to the community. How much is the, of the salary? Is salary component of it. Yes. You know, point. What, how much money is it as compared to their relative income of the household? The oh, you mean the uh, what we pay towards maintenance yes. versus the income? Yes. Or is it flat rate for everyone? It is a it's a flat rate per apartment. It is they based on the apartment you live on, size of the apartment, the type of apartment, and uh, more or less it's a flat rate. But for heavy projects, then it depends on the way we, we co collect something called the sinking fund, so which is for the capital expenditure. So we have a regular maintenance, which is on a monthly, what we use for running, you know, the energy, security, you know, uh, running the whole place. How much does it, how does it compare to the average community charge in Chennai? Is it higher? Very low. Very low. Uh, that, is, uh, that is paradoxical. Please yes. Explain. So it is because uh, till date, yes, it's yeah, it, it, it is lower. Our per apartment community uh, per month, what we pay to maintain this apartment is lower because all of us have been contributing. 
you know we don't have an external agency managing this uh, it has been our personal time a lot of people have spent enormous amount of time in managing these projects efficiently and actually uh, i don't know if it's uh, it it could even be unfair but their time is not calculated in the project cost so it has been done selflessly by people in uh, you know so if we had handed this over these over to external agencies uh, all these projects would have been uh, costlier by upwards of 40% upwards of 40% so each and every each and every project has been micromanaged by people who have the uh, t- uh, qualification or the knowledge to get the best deal for the community so for instance uh, you know when we implemented the drip irrigation system i already had some people supplying the pipes and doing the thing so we we got a very good deal in terms of the cost of implementing that if we had done it uh, you know if we were not part of this we didn't know the right people and how to do it we would have paid minimum double twice that amount so all of us pitched in that way in every project so even in the led project when we changed there was a friend of mine who got into the led business just then led technology was new and people were still so again we got a very very good deal in terms of you know how to uh, you know maximize the benefits in terms of costs in terms of technology in terms of which ones to use because uh, not always is it cost it's also what is the right you know we have to see cost of lifetime lifetime cost so all that helps so i think everyone in the community pitched in hence our cost of managing this all these projects and on a monthly basis is much lower compared to most other apartments so when they say everybody pitched in first we'll go to whether you use external agents that is you sold to the recyclers or gave to the municipality the solid waste then i'd like to ask you first um, we'll go to the next question mario we uh engage this person uh, who a uh, scrap dealer uh 5 or 6 years ago and uh, we did not make money out of what was going to him in fact we were trying that he should make enough money so he feels uh you know like worth his time to come and collect and we were there was some pilferage of uh, uh things uh you know by this people like uh, um I, i mean uh, staff or you know some people like uh, of uh, some uh, things of high scrap value so a uh, couple of us would go around and police that we didn't want uh, uh, this man to come and get only multi layer plastic from the bin which happened initially so we were not making any money out of it and and 3 uh, years down that line when we felt that uh, uh, it was just not fair To, uh, for him to come more often initially it was twice thrice a week we wanted him to come four times a week because we did not want our bins to overflow people were complaining you know and uh, so at that point one of our members like ram when we met at the uh, green club he said why don't we pay him something so we started paying him a small amount you know to and of course we i and bhuvna especially and uh, the many more uh, volunteers couple of us at least keep in touch with him to uh, know that he is disposing of how he is handling that waste whether mlps are being dumped on the streets or he is giving it to the right person you know and uh, so all that we are uh, doing is that ans- does it answer your question okay uh, okay mari absolutely thank you very much thank you raja was next i would ask yeah. everybody asking yeah. the question to keep comments to a minimum and ask the questions because we have only 15 minutes left okay yeah. Yeah. thank you so much it's uh, it was first of all very wonderful to hear a lot of learning um, uh, i had questions on capital cost and operating costs and in a sense uh, it has been uh, largely answered uh and also how much time is kind of being spent so if i have to phrase it in a question if we still are able to put a ballpark figure can you give a say the community size uh number 1 number 2 is uh, uh, an estimation of uh, uh, uh the capital cost and how much you are spending monthly now 
and how much time uh, is the core team uh, uh, spending away from their professional work so community size capital cost operating cost and core core people uh, maybe how many hours uh, a month or something hours? like that so i think the core uh, team in the committee so we have an elected uh, committee and each is assigned uh, while for every project or uh, activity there are three members but typically one person champions it and uh, right. so i would think that person the person who champions a certain activity would spend uh, in in a day uh, at least 2 hours a day okay a day away from their professional activity so even if they are at work uh, they would be networking they'll be finding out quotation or how this is done how can we do this better and all because i i i know it, i have done that so i would still be talking i would be searching i would talk to people in terms of can we use this instead of that and things like that so apart from physically spending time in the community and getting things done so in terms of uh, acquiring knowledge trying to get the negotiate the best deal and implementation an average of 2 hours per day would a good 2 hours yeah. if you want to get good results yes right. so uh, one more question Vidya, how many people are in the core team which spends these two hours? So I want a man hours per community of 175. Uh, there are uh, usually any committee. There will be five core members. There will be a president, a secretary, a treasurer, a joint secretary, and a vice president. See, if any project which we take up, like all these community projects, all the five of us have to get together. we need to you know put in efforts to get quotations for the same uh, and then you know that treasurer each one has their own uh, oh. specific specific work to be done to get the project done so the meeting if if you are going to a project every week at least we spend 2 hours to know what is the progress of work first it is the planning and then the execution and you know getting things done at the right time so that five members will be taking to us a day every day uh, i think uh, raja this is very interesting because the governance seems to the communication in the governance seems to be better than in our ministries you know because <laughs> in fact for the stp we have a permanent committee you know a committee of three or four people and they are constantly at work right so with with the change in the management also the committee doesn't change because they, this is going to be an ongoing thing and they have to spend that much of time they are all volunteers right and and what's the community size and uh, what would have been the capital project of all these things put together just a ballpark idea i also there's a time you know because uh, that's true it, that's why i'm saying ballpark Uh, if you are yeah, to do well, it today so yeah the community size is like i said uh, it is anywhere between 600 to 800 it varies right, right. yeah it's 175 so you know it varies sometimes it's three people four people whatever so that is the community size in terms of the projects the biggest one was the sewage treatment plant sewage treatment, that, right. yes that cost about 25 lakhs of rupees over mm-hmm. a period of time to implement and get it going uh, but if you look at but if you again we had the benefit of uh, you know people helping us sharing knowledge how to do it you know all that so it is not a fancy consultancy or fancy company doing these things uh in terms of all other projects put together in fact in 2007 the drip irrigation probably cost us about 40000 rupees oh. 35 to 40 okay, okay. Uh, even at that time it would have cost us double right yeah but we were able to procure it in a very effective way and we just able to actually what we did is uh, we got the material individually from wherever i knew we could get we bought mm-hmm. the material called this guy and asked him to implement it for us so literally that's what we assembled it for him so since we knew how the system works that's what we got done so had we just given it as a turnkey project to somebody it would have cost us over 80000 rupees okay mm-hmm. so uh, many of these projects actually uh, were not very expensive so the grey water recycling would have probably cost us in all together maybe 30 40000 rupees yeah maybe lesser because if you consider the, the uh, you know building the tank all that oh, to- yeah. all that together 
you know, two tanks and you know all that the pipeline and all about forty thousand rupees. But I'm talking of these are all in two thousand seven eight. Right. Then, we, then then the RO water discharge we were able to you know treat it and use it in the cisterns. You know, so how much would that have cost? Yeah, the RO water. Yeah, so probably. Yeah, so also there were savings also. You know, for instance, this RO water, the discharge, it was going to the drain. So we had a problem where we were pumping the water into the drainage system because the flow was not there. We had to have a motor to pump out our sewage. Okay. Right. Right. So there were complaints. There was a pressure on the system, and since we are in the middle of this heart of the city, and uh, a big community, so in some aspects we are also a nuisance to the drainage system and all that. Yeah. So. the benefit of the zero water treating this uh, discharge and using our systems was multifold one we stopped pumping it out so there was less pressure on the uh, corporation sewage system two we started using some water in the systems even it was just a few thousand liters per day we started using three we didn't have to pump it we were saving energy because the discharge of that was by gravity oh beautiful so, so gravity has this wonderful thing so whatever energy whatever it acquires when coming down it can go up the same extent so we use the gravity for it to go into our flush tanks so we were saving a lot of energy there so while some of these attracted capital cost there were also ongoing savings in many yeah. which in a way over a period of time paid off so and which resulted in us generating cash for future projects also over time so when we went back to the community with another project we had actually saved some energy you know some electricity bill or something so beautiful yeah, people saw the benefit yeah. and so we were able to get a better buy in every time right. and it seems for the entire community maybe less than a crore yeah i mean Very everything much. taken together that is the big i, I don't think we message. spent more than uh, no, no. 40 <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got yeah. that, but I'm just uh, adding on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. with one contingency, like, everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. one crore is a very big number for us. <laughs> yes, yes, right. That's the thing. It's that's because you didn't hire some fancy consultant. We would have charged you four crores. Okay, bye. <laughs> so, any other questions? You know, this is your moment. Otherwise, I'm. We are going to stop very soon. Okay. Mm. So yes, yes, yes. Yes. See, actually, I was also working with one of the uh, NGOs called Safe City, where which we crowdsource data on uh, women who face domestic violence as well as sexual harassment. So I had a thought that how to deploy these people into waste management. I mean, so that they can be more independent in terms of financial. status as well so this was one thing which i was wondering and we had pitched in two areas like women climate women in environment where we can uh, bring them more independent bring more independence so that was one question which i always wanted to ask can i can i reformulate your question i i understand where you're coming from i understand your question what mm -hmm. uh, she means is you see what has been the impact of your initiative okay on the poor okay in the community yes. because you know all that you have done we see the impact on your community and on the corporation but exactly. you see most of the waste management uh, chains you know are are manned by the poor and like for example she gave a very interesting example of how the recycler they made sure that he got money but what about your maids what about all your maids and all the people did it help them in any way did they what was the impact uh, see one of the important things was you know the educate the maids right and uh, uh, initially i think we had a program with inder kumar but later on we called more number of maids and uh, ram actually made a huge presentation and he spoke to them about climate change about how you know plastic was affecting you know clogging the drains and going to the marines and you know affecting marine life right and he did this with a lot of visuals right and strangely enough uh, they were very knowledgeable about it 
and they you know lapped it all up very very easily now we had to train them because you know in a lot of houses the cooks and maids were doing the segregating also you know especially the kitchen maids and thing so we were very very successful in you know educating them and we had the block sweepers also who were you know uh, you know taking their waste in the right way and we had uh, you know when we went on rounds and we found that some of the maids were not collecting it properly we actually had to replace them because they were not keeping up with the our standards now we also went a step ahead and we said you got to do this in your houses as well right mm-hmm. so maybe they are not generating as much of solid waste as we do but we have kind of trained them to do that now how successful we are i don't know but i'm sure it would have you know reached a uh, home then uh, you know the garbage collectors the street cleaners we are in constant touch with them right almost you know on a daily basis you know our uh, incentivize them and we incentivize them also and one of our volunteers mr bharat he's in touch with the corporation officials and he makes sure that you know people are in you know complying with uh, the rules that have been set by the corporation itself right Do we pay them extra for uh, uh, taking what goes where? You know, the uh, staff that comes to our doorstep. So the salaries have gone up, and uh, we've been uh, telling them that if that it's important, we send that out, and that man makes little money, and uh, otherwise he will stop coming. You know, so we have incentivized them. We uh, appreciate their efforts. from time to time we uh, you know get them together and uh, during festivals uh, you know uh, applaud their uh, uh, efforts in uh, helping the community you know yeah, yeah. thank you yeah thank you so uh, is there any last question otherwise i'm going to close the session you can always send us your question by email just want to ask all of you in uh, joining me to join me and uh, thank our panelists